This is not a review of the Blackmagic Pocket 6K. This is just a little bit of an overview of the camera in light of the fact that Blackmagic have just announced a price drop on these, so you can get these now cheaper than ever before. Here are some things that I love about this camera. It shoots Blackmagic RAW. Really important for us, we're doing all of our productions now with Blackmagic RAW. We're shooting on Ursa Pro and Ursa G2 and that Pocket 6K. Because that Pocket 6K shoots Blackmagic RAW, it is thoroughly compatible with the other two and the look stays consistent regardless of which camera we're shooting on. We've got 6K of resolution there, so actually we've got more resolution in the camera than we do on the Ursas, so it's a really versatile little package. It's really lightweight. So compared to the Ursas, it's a much smaller camera. It isn't as small as some mirrorless cameras that you're gonna find, but compared to what we're working with, what we're used to with the rigs that we're using, that's tiny. So being able to use it in really confined spaces, there's some shoots which I'm currently under embargo for, I can't talk about, where I've been doing a lot of automotive work with some really big brands. And on the exterior shots, we're using the Ursa Pros. And I've got this camera set up with a handheld rig and that's got um, a 100 mil macro on with image stabilization. And I'm just able to jump into these cars and get these detail shots working around really, really fast and know that uh, what, I'm, what I'm doing there is at 6K resolution, it's Blackmagic RAW, it's gonna knit perfectly with the other stuff, and then I could just pass it off to Rathika and she can grab it, take it away, and then we're back to working on the exterior stuff with the bigger cameras. So it's really cool for those little things where I've gotta get in somewhere tight, and we can still get all of the goodness out of it that we would be with the other cameras, but it's just a smaller packet. It also shoots on CFast cards, which is a plus for us, ironically, because we're heavily invested in CFast cards with the Ursas. Um, I know that you can put the SDs in, and occasionally we do use SD cards with it if we want to shoot ProRes at a lower resolution, um, but that's pretty rare. We generally just stick with the CFasts. Now, a benefit for other people will be that this actually allows you to have SSD drives plugged into that USB-C port, and that's a much more cost-effective way of getting fast storage for your shoots. The reason we don't use this at Still Moving is we have access to CFast cards. The SSDs always struck me as a slightly risky um, operation because you have a cable coming out, cable going into a hard drive, and on the shoots that we do, we just can't risk that coming unplugged. So if we lose a load of footage because a drive corrupts because it gets pulled when we're moving between setups, that's bad. So we would rather use uh, the internal CFast card option just because the level of shoot that we're operating on we're talking tens and tens of thousands of pounds per shoot. It's just not worth us having an SSD drive hanging off this thing. I know there are a lot of options for cages on this now, and you can slot those drives in and secure them down, but still, personally, we go for the CFast option because we have access to that. Next positive here is that it's Super 35. It is a slightly smaller flavor of Super 35 than the Ursa is, but it's close enough that I don't really mind, and it means that we're operating on the same lenses with the same expected field of view, give or take, we'll get used to the difference, there's no problem there. The downside for us of the Pocket, even though it's a really good camera, lots of features, similar body, all the rest of it, is that uh, we have to use a speed booster on it. Now we have done the whole speed booster thing, we had the original 2.5K, we've had two of the original Pockets as well, so we've done the whole speed boost thing. The downside was that uh, putting those lenses on, you don't know your f-stop as well as you do with these, so when we're trying to match f-stops between different cameras, if we've got a speed boost sitting in between, it doesn't quite tally. You can't just, you can't quite as easily say, we're going to a 5.6, set everything to 5.6, because you've got the speed booster there, it doesn't work like that. And that's a downside. When we're trying to be efficient, when we're trying to um, unify everything, it's better for us to be working on this one than it is the pocket with the speed booster. Speed booster would give us the same field of view, but it would mean that uh, there's another thing to think about in terms of uh, setting everything up. So we just avoid it, go with the 6K, it's better for us, better for our workflow. Won't be better for everyone, but that's our experience with it. A lot of the time on shoots, we're using wireless monitoring. So we've got the small HD wireless monitors. We'll be setting up Video Village for clients. It's nice to have the full size HDMI port on this one because it's a little bit more secure than the micro HDMIs that we've seen previously on the pocket cameras uh, when they came out originally. Uh, it would be nice for us to have an SDI, but full size HDMI is okay. Screen on the back is nice and big. When we do need to do something, at least that's a nice large screen to look at. It's not flipping, which is perhaps a downside, uh, something you have to consider. There are options for modifying this, so you can do 
a tilty screen if you want to, but like I say, most of the time for us, it doesn't really make any difference because we're not using the screen on the back, we're using monitoring, whether that's remote monitoring or that's another monitor on the camera it just isn't an issue because we always have access to that. The fact this camera has dual native ISO and that makes it very sensitive in low light conditions is really cool. There are a lot of shoots we've done where we've been working with the probe lens recently and because that lens is <laughs> a very slow lens, you need an awful lot of light to actually get what you need out of it. And on top of that, I actually wanna stop it down more a lot of the time so that we get a slightly deeper depth of field because you're so close to everything that the depth of field can be oppressively shallow. So stopping down on a lens, which I think starts at F14, and we might wanna take it down to F22, means that uh, you need every little bit of light that you can get. Because it has that higher ISO option built in, we found ourselves using it instead of the ISO on those kind of shoots. We're using the probe lens and we need all of the light we can get and on those shoots, we're, we're bringing in tons of stuff, so we will be lighting these tabletop setups with HMIs. But still, to stop down, to get everything we want out of it, we find ourselves deferring to the pocket because it's the better option in that scenario. As you can see on the screen behind me, we do a lot of vehicle work. This has been really handy for on-vehicle rigs. So we can rig the Ursas. We've got all of the grip necessary to do it, but they're quite a lot bigger. And often on these shoots, we'll be doing multiple camera angles at the same time. So having the Ursas on tripods or on the black arm rig, and then having the pocket there to do the on-body stuff is actually really cool. It means that we're keeping the Ursas for those things. And then we got this dedicated to doing the on-body mounted stuff, obviously because it's lighter. It means that uh, the rigging is under less strain. Having said that, we're using the same rigging that we'd be using for the Ursa. So it just means that everything's really, really secure when we're doing that. The fact that there's a smaller camera body helps us to get it in certain places as well, where we're not having to worry so much about uh, twisting and catching the edge of the car. So it's really cool for those applications. Now the way the buttons are laid out on this is more akin to a DSLR. So you do have a little wheel here for changing whichever of the functions you have selected, whether that be white balance, ISO, shutter speed, you can be changing that with a wheel. And for anyone coming from that background, that will be a little bit more familiar to you. You do have the option to shoot stills on this actually as well. We've done it occasionally, but generally it's not something that we're having to do for the shoot. So we don't really touch that feature. Now on top of all of that, uh, Blackmagic have just announced the new ATEM Mini Pro and all of the functionality boosts that we're getting using that with this pocket camera now. So we're getting all of the tally lights, we're getting control of the cameras from the ATEM software. So all of that's really cool. We've done quite a lot of live stream before. We've live streamed Hillary Clinton, David Attenborough. We do the FameLab live streams all over the world. Previously, when doing this on Ursus, we've been running two SDI lines to get the same kind of functionality. Now it's all over one HDMI cable. You've got the tangle lights built in, you've got control built in, and it's really cheap because they've done that uh, price reduction because the ATEM Mini Pro is a really cost-effective way of getting into all of that. It's actually a really attractive solution if you are looking to do any live streaming. So that's definitely something that we're curious about for the smaller live streams that we might do where we're not having to do really long SDI runs. These are all positives. What are the downsides for me compared to the Ursas, for example? Well, I think that the most obvious difference between the Ursa that I'm filming on at the moment and this camera is that there are no internal NDs on the pocket. A lot of the time when we're out on shoots, those internal NDs are really handy, especially if we're doing anything fast moving, we can just flick the ND wheel, get the stop that we want on the lens, get the filtration in place that allows us to get that stop and have everything working really smoothly, really quickly. It's not an insurmountable problem and we can just use physical filtration in front of the lens. And indeed we're starting to do that more on some of the shoots that we're doing because we have more time, because we have more crew but it is something you need to consider. And you should be trying to go for a nice filtration so that you're making use of all that resolution so that you're getting the best out of your image. So factory in buying filtration if you don't already have it is something you should think about when you purchase the camera. But that's true of practically any mirrorless camera at the moment, you're not gonna be getting an internal ND system. So it isn't a downside in the context of cameras that are competing with this, it's just a downside for us when we're out on a shoot compared to an Ursa. If we're thinking, do I wanna go out on a shoot with an Ursa or this, well this one's smaller, but then the Ursa has the internal filtration and has the batteries, we're using gold mount batteries that we can just click on and off. So that allows us to shoot for longer and have everything in one package. Also having the SDI ports obviously on that camera mean that we can use it in different ways with different bits of equipment 
compared to the HDMI port on this one. But those examples are really just looking at the tools that we have and deciding which one is the better tool for a very specific job. The fact the Ursa takes those um, Core SWX gold mount batteries means that we can quickly and easily run the camera all day. We don't have the same option on the Pocket because that takes LPE6 Canon batteries internally and those don't last long enough for us on shoots. So instead what we would do is use a core power base with this, with the LP6 dummy battery adapter, and then that allows us to run the pocket in a more similar way to the Ursa. There are considerations about how we rig that, and we can have it on the side of the cage that I've got on the moment, or we can rig it off the camera, say on a tripod, so that we can quickly and easily clip it off, move it somewhere else. Whatever we want to do, there is an option to do it. It just means that we've got to consider that and build the rig around it. Do we want it to be super lightweight? Do we want it to be a bit bigger, but be able to run it all day without thinking about it? These are just things that you need to decide when you're setting up for your shoot. So here's the big question in this summary video. Remembering this isn't a review, this is just our experience of how we've used it and how we find it at this point in time. Would I recommend the Pocket 6K now that they just had that big price drop? And the answer is yes, definitely. I think that it's a really worthwhile camera. It gives you a lot of bang for your buck. So there's no other camera on the market that's gonna give you the options of media as well. You can go to SD cards, you can go to CFast cards, you can go to the SSD drives. So it's up to you how you populate it and you can gradually build up your storage capacity as you go along, choosing to buy the media that is appropriate for you. If you're just using ProRes and you're not doing anything crazy, then the SD cards are the cheapest, the best option for you. If you want to shoot a little bit uh, more 6K RAW, then using the SSD drive is a very cost-effective way. If you're concerned about the SSD drive being a solution which is potentially prone to failure, then you've got the CFast option. You can power it through the little port on the side, which locks into place. Always love having locking connectors. Or you can power it through the battery. You can put an LP6 in there, keep it really small, just have a stock of them. Or you can put a dummy battery in, use the core power base, and then you can power it for hours and hours without having to worry about carrying lots of extra batteries around. So it is a camera which is, at its core, compact, but then is able to be built out with lots of different options. And for us, for the ecosystem that we're using, for the post workflow within DaVinci that I'm using, this camera actually sits really neatly and fills a niche which perhaps before we would have had to go to a other small mirrorless camera to fill. Now we can have everything within the Blackmagic ecosystem, shooting Blackmagic RAW at Super 35, not going to a micro four thirds body, and making everything unified is so important with our post workflows and the speed that we have to deliver things and the look that clients expect out of our shoots. This actually ticks a massive box for us. So yes, I would absolutely recommend it a year on and I think that a lot of people will find that at this price point it's very very hard to resist.